Hi, good morning, good day, and very welcome to August Global Gasoline Conference. Um, it's a pleasure having you here with us today. We are starting off our opening panel talking about the latest developments in the European gasoline market. I have the pleasure of having Kevin Wright with me, uh, lead analyst at Kepler. Welcome, Kevin. Francis uh, Osborne, Head of Forecasting Argus, welcome. Hi. Good Hi, to good here. to have you. Yes, good to have you here as well. Uh, we also have another colleague here, George Kinkasel, Associate Editor from Argus. Great to have you here as well, George. Good morning, hello. Hello, good morning. Um, so let's dive straight into it and talk about what's going on here in Europe. Um, Kevin, could I start with you just telling us, I mean, what you see from where you sit and what's been going on on the gasoline markets recently and over the last quite uh, turbulent um, year and so? Thanks very much, Josephine, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to Argus on behalf of Kepler uh, for inviting me to participate in today's uh, discussion. As you'd expect, I work for Kepler and we, we track commodities. And so what I'm going to look at today are some of the flows and the way that the flows have developed over the last couple of years, even into the last couple of months. Now, earlier this year, we've had, or over the course of this year, we've had two significant events that have impacted supply within the US itself. And on this first chart, which shows European gasoline flows to the US, we can see what happened to those volumes as a result of those events. The first of those events was a, a cold snap uh, that affected US Gulf Coast refining significantly back in February. Something like 2.4 million barrels per day of refining capacity were taken offline around Texas and the Gulf Coast. But in actual fact, across the wider US, 3.7 million barrels per day, or 20% of US refining capacity, were impacted. Now that peaked on the 17th of February, and we can see on this chart how the market responded. March, exports from Europe reached 512,000 barrels per day, KBD, and and uh, April exports from Europe actually reached 521 KBD. Now, May is on chart or on track rather to export something like 370,000 barrels per day. But to give you some context, the two year average of uh, flow from Europe to the US is 297 KBD. And in 2020, which we understand was, which, which we all know was, was uh, significantly impacted by COVID demand destruction, saw only 247,000 barrels per day flowing. So clearly the numbers that we're seeing in March and April, or that we've seen in March and April, are almost double what we saw in 2020. That was in response uh, to, the, to the February cold snap, and as we know, the impact that that had. Now moving into May, and I know George is going to cover this in a little moment, but looking at the current price across the US, the US gasoline price is, is currently averaging over $3 per barrel. That's the first time since 2014. Now, that clearly is going to incentivize arbitrage. And so as a result of the second event that, we, that we've seen this year that has severely affected uh, supply, i.e. the colonial pipeline cyber attack, we can expect to see a raised level of arbitrage barrels and therefore a continuation of the trend that we've seen here. We're going to talk a little bit later on, I know, about east of Suez to west of Suez flows and about developments within the gasoline market. So I won't, I won't uh, dwell too long on, on that situation here but it is a similar picture. The average east of Suez to west of Suez flow over the last two years has been around 100,000 barrels per day. And in March, it reached 309,000 barrels per day, of which 105 went to the US. So clearly the US is the determining factor. However, Nigeria, which normally imports nothing from east of Suez, actually imported 129,000 barrels per day in March, the highest level seen since March of 2020. Thanks, Kevin, for that. And George, just tell us, um, what have you seen from your side covering this market at Argus and following the price developments? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks both. I mean, it's, you know, it, as far as the European market is concerned, um, the US disruption was very, uh, very timely. Uh, disruption of very timely, timely supportive action uh, for European suppliers. Um, you know, it helped clear a lot of the excess volumes that were built up over the winter, um, so a lot, not just finished gasoline, but also components that were put into storage uh, on and offshore um, over the winter when um, you know, components such as Refram and Alcolet were very cheap. Uh, finished grade gasoline blending was very cheap. So a lot of the, although winter grade gasoline obviously can't 
can't be used um, this time of year, but a lot of the components um, went into storage um, over the um, when over the winter and the um, storms and the out the loss of output in the U.S. really helped um, drive a lot of these um, stocks down. Um, and we saw the impact on the European market very supportive. And um, so a lot of flows, um, a lot of gasoline heading to the US um, in March and April. And it coincided, again, you know, very timely, it coincided with the move to peak, um, you know, into the peak demand season for gasoline, but also the switch to summer, summer grade gasoline. So, you know, we had, um, I've got a couple of graphs here um, on just on the European product cracks, uh, but regional cracks as well. And we can see the jump um, on um, Eurobob uh, gasoline cracks to Brent and um, wailing to um, double digit premiums um, at, the, at the start of, the, of April as we move to summer spec uh, gasoline. Um, and we've averaged around about $10 a barrel um, in Northwest Europe and um, refining margins um, for gasoline, which you know is almost double what we've seen um, on diesel, um, almost three times as what we've seen on jet. So, you know, European uh, gasoline has, has, has um, very outperformed um, the European um, complex. Um, and, you know, it has, um, benefited from the fact also that um, European refining is geared much more heavily towards diesel. Um, so, you know, there's only so much more um, refining output that can be switched on um, for, for gasoline. There's only so many um, barrels um, of crude that can be diverted into hydrocrackers um, over FCCs. And um, so, you know, we've benefited from these these outages in the US um, and also the fact that European refining coming into spring maintenance, you know, has kept supply relatively tight. So these, um, these twin impacts on supply um, and demand you know, have given a real boost um, to gasoline, gasoline producers here. And it really was, you know, much of a boon, really, um, to the European market. And we can see there's another chart here when we look at the ARBs, um, you know, so we had um, the Westmount ARB um, measured as, as ARBOB against EBOB, but also taking into account um, RVO costs, which is quite important here. It's another, you know, kind of slight, slight quirk of the US market, um, the, the, RIN, the credit costs uh, for, for compliance, uh, environmental compliance for producers there has been, you know, very, very high. So we take that into account, but we've still got um, westbound, um, westbound economics, westbound arbitrage routes were, you know, as high, the, the ARB was as high in March and April um, as it has been, and, you know, really at levels that we don't normally see outside of um, the summer. Um, conversely, you know, we look at the eastbound spread, and, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, when Kevin's already mentioned the um, the flows, um, the competition in, um, you know, markets like Africa, um, um, east of Suez, um, export ARBs have been very negative. So actually, instead of gasoline going that way, gasoline has been coming the other way. Um, and actually, what we have seen is increased competition for European exporters in markets such as West Africa, South Africa, actually, you know, has another, been another bit of a, um, a kind of battleground uh, for gasoline um, as well. Um, and, but, you know, the real story for this for, for the first quarter and, you know, still now, still now is um, the, the return of U.S. demand and simultaneously you know, coinciding with, the, with a dramatic loss of output over there as well. And George, I got to ask, as we are a price reporting agency here, um, liquidity underpinning the benchmarks on your Bob Oxy. Um, how how do you see that market yeah. over these last very, very well, sort of interesting mm -hmm. last few yeah. months? Yeah, interesting. I think is um, you know one way to put it. The last the last 15, 16 months. I mean, we were, you know if it was like you know a bit of a uh, groundhog day again, perhaps you know a year in now. Um, you know we're looking back what happened this time last year. Um, you know, March, April. So even at the height of, you know, the demand destruction and the uncertainty um, around COVID, you know, back in March, April last year, um, you know, we look at our volumes and we've got, got, a, got a chart on our, um, you know, Eurobob Oxy and non-Oxy volumes last year. So on our benchmark Oxy grade, you know, we, we had um, volumes of about, I think it was 80,000 tonnes in March um, last year. You know, we, and it was, you know, it was a record low for us, but, you know, to have volumes still, to still that high, at still that level, you know, I think there was a lot of, um, you know, we were we were quite happy with the level of robustness um, around the assessment, and there were there were very very few days where we had, um, you know, liquidity below our minimum thresholds. Um, so, you know, we feel like we certainly survived um, the, the the COVID pandemic in terms of our barge um, assessments. Um, and what we also did see is a development towards um, overall for Europe barge liquidity. We, we still topped four million tons uh, for, two, for 2020, which is down just 5% on 2019, which was itself um, a record year. And one of the reasons, um, you know, one of the reasons why we were still, I think we still were able to capture quite a lot of this market was 
um, the increased liquidity on non-oxy, um, you know, which increased, I think, almost 50% um, year on year from 2019 to 2020. So we did see some of the oxy volumes move to non-oxy uh, last year, and that is a trend that's carried on um, this year and a trend that we would expect to continue. But I just wanted to check, um, Francis, what do you see there? The gasoline demand, how, how does it look like and how are the European refiners doing there? The demand obviously has recovered from the, the, the worst impacts last year in the second quarter, back in April. Um, European demand was, well, an estimated six million barrels a day of, of, of sales were lost literally almost overnight. Um, I've never seen that in all my years in the industry. I've never seen an impact quite so quite so large and quite so sudden. Uh, and obviously, at the global level, it was uh, equally equally bad. Um, in in many ways, it was um, it was relatively short lived, massive, but relatively short lived. Uh, I guess if we were to far, roll forward from April, maybe by about July, I would think pretty much globally that we had recovered um, a large proportion of that drop, uh, but sales have been down on pre-pandemic levels ever since. Um, George has already uh, talked about the US market. Um, <clears throat> the US economy is doing pretty well now. Um, the Biden administration has certainly injected a lot of liquidity and uh, stimulus into the economy. Uh, there's real expectation or perhaps hope is a better word that there's going to be a stellar driving season this year as uh, everyone uh, newly released from lockdown is going to hit the road and uh, um, and drive gasoline sales um, but if we look at the latest monthly data then US demand is still about half a million barrels a day lower than it was at the same point in 2019. Uh, Europe it's probably around 200 to maybe 300,000 lower than before. Um, and even if we look further afield to the more sort of uh, the emerging markets where traditionally we expect to see much stronger demand dynamics, um, there's precious, well, there is absolutely no evidence uh, across, we, we look at Brazil, India and Mexico on a monthly basis, you can get timely data for, for sales there. Um, and certainly through uh, March, uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that demand has, has recovered to um, uh, back to pre-pandemic levels. It, it's pretty much capped at where it was uh, at the, the, the back end of 2019. Uh, and of course, with the uh, dreadful um, uh, situation in India, uh, demand there has again collapsed uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and I think interestingly, if we even look at China, uh, now China has been on a pretty even keel economically for the best part of a year now since since the end of lockdowns right at, uh, back in Q2 last year. Um, there are no data for China. Um, it's a massive data black hole. Uh, nobody knows. We all do various calculations to try and estimate what's going on. Um, I've looked at the PetroChina and Sinopec quarterly data. They report domestic sales of gasoline and diesel. I can't split the two. Um, and again, even in Q1 of this year, uh, their reported sales were still down on where they were um, before the, 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 the COVID situation emerged. So I think even China is looking a little lacklustre, although anecdotally uh, reports recently have um, uh, suggested that demand has picked up in uh, with, with, with the holiday, with the May holiday season. Uh, we shall wait and see what, what the data show for Q2. So demand, it's better than it was, <coughs> a lot, lot better. Um, but it's still looking a bit uh, a bit weak, certainly compared to the pre pre COVID situation. Um, the refiners have just had the worst possible year. Uh, my second chart shows this in very starkly. Um, just looking at the two principal upgrading configurations, cat cracking and coking. Um, the cat cracker traditionally never really makes much money. Uh, margins usually hobble, bounce around, break even, sometimes a bit positive, quite often a little bit negative. 
Uh, but what really has hurt, um, uh, well, what has been astonishing this year is that even coking margins uh, have been negative pretty much consistently since uh, uh, since since Q2 of last year. Uh, that just does not happen. That is. Uh, that just shows that the refining system is basically uh, almost insolvent in, in, in a sense at the moment. It's not making money. Uh, that cannot continue. Um, it must change. Um, refiners are doing what refiners have to do in this situation. They're keeping utilisation under control. But in, in many ways, gasoline is the success story. Um, you know, we've already mentioned gasoline cracks of certainly improved demand has recovered to some extent and may uh, I, I expect probably will strengthen further over the summer period um, but what is really weighing down on the refiner is the dreadful cracks across the middle distillate complex um, diesel cracks at I think about seven dollars in Europe so they've actually got a little bit better recently um, but seven dollars is a crack you would associate with $25 oil, not $65 oil. So combine that level of crack with the kind of crude prices that we're seeing in the market today. Uh, and it's hardly surprising that the refiner is, 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 in a sense, bleeding to death at the moment. So it will mean a prolonged period of uh, restrained utilisation. Uh, and of course, what we're also seeing is uh, it's going to mean uh, capacity closures. Um, the two will combine eventually to underpin a return to profitability. Uh, you cannot have an industry consistently losing money uh, in, in a sense as they are at, at the moment. So desperate times uh, and the hangover is unfortunately proving prolonged and painful. Thanks. Thanks, Francis. And I mean, yes, picking up from that as if a COVID year here wouldn't be enough. We also see big structure changes going on in the market with energy transition kicking in, um, which I think, for example, let's come back to you, Franz, just to hear about what you think that will, um, what the impacts will be on, on, on the gas in markets from that. But um, George, do you also want to maybe explain Tell us about non-oxy and what is it that's going on here, and 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 because this is really one of the really how to say most uh, strongest impacts we see on the actual gasoline market at the moment, isn't it? Sure, sure. Look, I mean, in the short term, you know, there's in, in terms of to meet you know these very um, these new very stringent targets um, to cut um, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one of the things that um, that the industry can do, and, and many many European countries have already you know um, taken taking some big steps forward, is to move to something we call E10 gasoline, which is 10% ethanol in your gasoline. Um, and at the moment. Um, you know, so countries such as so the large uh, gasoline consuming countries such as France, Germany uh, and the UK, um, the France, France and Germany introduced um, E10 gasoline um, a number of years ago, um, but their uptake is is limited. Um, you know, it's about about 50 percent in France um, and maybe just 10 percent in Germany. Now, the UK is introducing E10 uh, gasoline in September um, and they're actually what they're doing is, is almost um, almost forcing everyone onto E10 gasoline um, by making the E5 only really available to those, um, you know, for, for old engines which can't take um, E10. Um, you know, so I, I would imagine the future is to try and get as many um, as many road users um, onto E10 gasoline as possible. Um, you know, and reduce. Um, and it's one of the ways, one of the one of the kind of really fairly, you know, fairly simple way um, to re to reduce greenhouse gas emissions without moving, you know, to electric vehicles. Um, you know, which is I think is still a number of years. Down the line. Now, the reason now we're coming back to oxy and non-oxy for those um, not in the know, um, non-oxy gasoline um, it doesn't have oxygen. It's um, primarily um, MTBE, which is um, banned um, in some places, such as the US and Canada. So you know, big um, importing countries. So so firstly, it makes uh, non-oxy gasoline um, you know more more fungible. Um, it's good because it can be exported, but um, you know more more important for the European market, non-oxy gasoline is the blend stock um, of choice for E10. Gasoline, um, you know, so we are expect. So we have already seen since, you know, we so we um, Argos have always assessed um, your of oxy gasoline as, as the European benchmark, and 
you know, that's where still a lot of the paper market is. It's still what um, the industry, you know, broadly uses to, to hedge its exposure on gasoline components. Um, but what we are starting to see um, since um, August moved to non-oxy gasoline um, as a standalone VWA at the end of 2019, we've seen, as I mentioned um, earlier, we've seen volumes on that you know, really pick up. Um, you know, and take us, you know, take us into what we see, you know, necessarily is that, you know, the future for gasoline, for the gasoline market. Again, non-oxy is that, you know, it's a blend stock of choice for E10 gasoline. And as, as we would expect, the uptake um, of E10 gasoline um, in, you know, broadly uh, across Europe. And I think it's something like 14 countries already. Um, and, you know, the big um, gasoline consuming um, regions, um, such as ARA, Scandinavia, um, UK, Possibly Ireland at the end of um, early next year, Sweden and Poland. I think are next. Um, you know, we'll be moving on to this um, gasoline with with greater ethanol content. And then the, I think the big, the next big step will be to get um, places like France and Germany to increase their um, uptake um, of E10 as well. But uh, but no, it really is the future, and, and non-oxy gasoline is the future. And we're, we're talking about the short-term future here. Um, but it really is the only real way that you know that the industry can can meet these um, you know more stringent targets uh, before the you know electric electrification of the transport fleet um, can really take hold. And you just want to I think you mentioned a figure before. I mean, we see this non-oxy barge market yeah. really picking up. Yeah. In in liquidity, and what were the sort of numbers you referred to before? Yeah, so we had so we had like a million tons um, of non-oxy uh, change hands in the ARA barge market last year, um, you know, for 2020 as a whole, um, you know, which is up, um, you know, over 50 percent on the previous year. Um, and I, I mentioned moving to a VWA um, as um, at the end of 2019, so that's a volume weighted average. So it's assessed as a as a standalone grade. Previously, we assessed it as a diff to um, E5, but now we um, talk to oxy gasoline. But now we, it's assessed as a standalone number. Um, you know, and the idea really is well, since we've seen these uh, volumes pick up. Um, you know, we've started to see, you know, the, the paper, the, you know, the key to these, um, you know, the physical markets, you know, the physical markets really underpin the, the derivatives market where, you know, where the volume um, vastly outweighs, um, you know, the, the physical side. And the key to the non-oxy market is really, you know, a take up on the on the derivative side. And we, ha we have started to see, you know, it is listed um, on various exchanges and we have started to see some uptake in it, some interest. Um, but, you know, it's early days, um, but once the two of them, um, once we can get the paper to to keep up to match the uh, match the physical side, you know, I think the future certainly is um, for on monoxy gasoline. Thanks for that, George. And I know there's a lot of work we are doing at the moment, also in terms of Northwest European cargo gasoline oh, yes. price, that is going to be yeah. um, available for anyone wanting to use to understand what that cargo market is basically um, looking like as it now develops. Um, but um, looking even further ahead, then, I mean, Francis, I understand. I mean, your team been looking at this a lot. What do you look on the? What do you think on the future of gasoline here in Europe? And I mean, the EVs, the electrification, and and how do you see that's going to play out here? Well, I, I wish I could be more optimistic <laughs> than I can be. Um, uh, unfortunately, the future uh, um, is electric um that's there's no two ways about it i mean europe uh is going to electrify much more quickly than any other region uh in the world um it's been slow progress but this year i would suggest um we're probably going to see about 10 percent of new car sales uh being a, a plug-in or a, a pure electric uh, technology um we all know that diesel's taken a, a complete hammering at the, in the sales room uh, for obvious reasons. That's now extending um, uh, towards gasoline as well. Um, it's a projection. Um, it needs some large assumptions, but I would suggest that by 2030, which is only not even 10 years away now, um, probably over half of uh, annual registrate new new sales will be uh, a pure or plug-in electric vehicle um it's it's it is the future manufacturers are switching wholesale to producing it um there are very generous incentives around i i, I can give you my own experience i'm actually possibly going to buy a plug-in hybrid myself uh, and volvo are very kindly going to give me 1200 pounds uh, to fit a charging point at my house. 
um, without which, of course, um, it's a much less attractive option. But they will come round and for free of charge, give me a charging point. Uh, that's an incentive in, in addition to which uh, they're also prepared to knock quite a few thousand pounds off the vehicle. The, the vehicle itself is £10,000 more than the petrol equivalent, uh, but that cost will come down. Uh, and I think uh, many people now believe that it won't be very long before the electric vehicle is at least uh, no more expensive and possibly even cheaper than its uh, petrol or diesel equivalent. So it will it will be an electric future. It will mean that uh, demand for road transport fuels, as we've always understood them, will steadily decline. Um, it's going to be most obvious in, in Europe. Um, uh, and I would suggest that probably if we look out towards 2030, 2035, that sort of period, uh, we would probably, if, if, the, if the system's going to adjust in line with the demand trend, we will see three to four million barrels a day more capacity closures. But it's no, it's no, um, it's no surprise that the, the move to to shut capacity is most aggressive in Europe of, of all the regions. It, it, it's happening in other regions, but it's very, very heavily focused in Europe. Either the outright closure of capacity or uh, the conversion to a bio capacity, uh, a renewable fuels cap capability, which, which I think is generally speaking, uh, taking taking hold um, and, and accelerating as, as a trend. No. I give you a shout later on, Francis. I, I mean, I'm one of those hybrid users. I'll, I'll share some experience on the back after this um, conference here. What to do? May no, I just, sorry, may I just yeah, go to ahead, George. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to say I'm buying a hybrid anytime. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I just wanted to say, you know, it's worth remembering. You know, as far as gasoline is concerned, production. Um, you know, even before COVID. You know, even before the move, the energy transition. You know, Europe is. You know, has been structurally long gasoline uh, for a long time. You know, there is the, there is you know a third of I mean almost a third of every barrel of gasoline produced in Europe um, has to leave the region. Um, you know, and it's something that the, the industries have you know, been struggling with for a number of years. Um, and you know, the COVID, like like with many things, COVID has accelerated this pace of change. Um, and we've already seen a number of refineries, you know, convert not necessarily close down, but can, you know to keep jobs. You know, the, the easy thing to do is you know convert them into you know other production, you know, biofuels. Um, and whatnot, um, you know, so um, so certainly it's a trend that we are only going to see accelerate, I think, in the next few years. Yeah, no, I, I, I really see a point and I am, um, yeah, there's definitely things going on here. Um, and uh, it almost, it, if, yeah, go if ahead. I may just add a, yeah, a yeah, sure. second point uh, just to um, uh, accentuate what George has said is that uh, the very unfortunate thing and, and another factor which will force capacity closure in Europe is that their traditional export markets are just becoming increasingly more competitive because it's we, we, we look at Europe as being very long in capacity potentially going forward, but it's a it's a, a global phenomenon. Um, you know, globally, demand will probably peak within the next 12 to 15 years at the outside, um, there will be, we will be increasingly long global capacity. Um, that means that the fight for to offload surplus product into the shorts, the structural shorts across the globe, which effectively are now narrowing down to Latin America, um, West Africa, South Africa, perhaps uh, East Africa or the Africa generally. Southeast Asia is traditionally uh, short of uh, gasoline in particular. That may well be plugged if, if Indonesia gets its act together and, and, and starts to construct capacity. I think there's a real chance now that that's going to happen. Um, we, we know Dangote is going to operate one day in Nigeria. Uh, that's going to close down um, demand for export barrels. but. Uh, what is so unwelcome for, for the European refiner is that other people, uh, particularly in Northeast Asia, will be looking to to access these markets. So it's going to be a very competitive uh, uh, export future as well as um, a fairly depressing uh, domestic demand future. 
Kevin, I mean, you had some thoughts about that as well. I mean, watching the flows and how products are likely to move. I mean, we discussed the other day Southeast Asia versus Northeast Asia, but really where the flows would go. Um, anything you want to share here with with our audience on that? <clears throat> no, I mean, I can only I can only echo what Francis has just said about you know the North Asian refineries, the the big refining centers of China that continues to grow, the refining center of Korea. Taiwan, to an extent, obviously Japan is a little bit different. They've rationalized in recent years. But these, these refining centers are going to get longer. Right? I mean, at the moment, the Chinese refining system is generally set up for domestic consumption. But the export level is increasing. And the refinery run levels or run rates are increasing. And their crude imports are incre increasing as a result. So what we're going to see as we go forwards is, yes, a, a, a global, a greater global competition for shorts. And the key ones are going to be the likes of Nigeria. Right, because effectively we're going to see a change in trade flows and we're also going to see a change in vessel usage. And what I mean by that is the economics of long haul freight are going to are going to prevail. So ultimately, people who can take LR2s of gasoline into West Africa are going to be much more competitive on price than those who are taking MRs from the likes of the Mediterranean. And ultimately, I think that's where you know the, the competition is going. That's where we're going to see uh, the, the the whole gasoline horizon evolved to and then eventually you get to the situation i think france is absolutely spot on again where you get rationalizations and we've seen this in the diesel market in the past where european refineries and med refineries in particular really struggle to compete with the, with imported barrels from the likes of the middle east and north asia so we get more arbitrage and that's eventually as I say, it, it brings in cheaper product, right? It drives the market and eventually that drives refinery ration, rationalization, which means refinery closure. So it's a continuation of the story that started 10, 15, maybe even 20 years ago. And I think this, the, the outlook is pretty bleak for European refiners right now. And any any thoughts from your side of, I mean, what are the, how to say, the features that would help you as a refiner survive in this? Um, Outlook with this outlook here. I mean, any, any anything you need to have in place that makes you a bit stronger versus competition. Um, infrastructure. So if you are able to take advantage of those larger import economics. So if you're looking at, for example, crude, maybe maybe you're talking about bringing bigger, bringing bringing bigger crude vessels in. Mm -hmm. You're talking about therefore you know lowering your unit cost, hopefully improving your margin. I mean, the the last thing you want to happen really as a refiner is what's happened in Australia. Yeah, I mean, Australia has gone from a situation of having around 800,000 barrels a day of refining capacity to about 400,000 now, and probably is even under threat at that level. Now, the Australian government is stepping in something close to 2 billion Aussie dollars of support for the existing refiners to stay open and to keep that industry running. But that's, that's kind of a desperate time. But that's the sort of situation we're in right now. I mean, Francis made the point a moment ago, and it's something I haven't really thought about, but when you look at a diesel crack at $7, that comes normally from an environment where crude is 25. And yet we're sitting here with crude at 65 and you've got a $7 crack. So for the refiner right now, you know, it's, it is it is bleeding and it's 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 tough to see a very positive outlook for, for refiners that can't step up in terms of logistics, can't step up in terms of infrastructure or throughput. And that ultimately is going to be, is going to be the game changer. I mean, we can talk about you know, Nelson complexity scales and technology and so on around refineries, you know, compare a reliance in Jamnagar with with a, with an SR in Stanlo or whatever, right? You're, you're talking about different different scales of of complexity and different <laughs> scales of size. And that's that's really what's going to drive it. So if you if you can get size and you can get technology, then that's going to help your, your refining margin to stay positive and ultimately help your refinery to stay in business. Any any comments on there from the other Panelist Francis or George here? Um, well, let me try and find a bit of a silver lining. Um, Sorry. I, I think actually the, <laughs> the I think the 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 outlook <clears throat> is now so bleak that um, that coupled with the growing pressure on the larger integrated to decarbonize, uh, to become green energy companies, uh, and that pressure is coming from shareholders. It's coming from the investment community so that <coughs> excuse me again <coughs> that is not pressure that can be ignored so they will act on it um, 
and that means that they are going to I'm not going to say leave the refining space, but significantly reduce their exposure to it. That offers a little glimmer of hope for the independent refiners, um, of which there are quite a number still. Um, so those refiners, those companies that that's all they do, they are refining uh, businesses. Um, they're usually very lean. They're going to be even leaner, certainly meaner. Um, but they have no future other than to leave and shut down entirely. They don't have the optionality of transforming their business. They, they can certainly move into renewables and they will. Uh, that That's um, definitely part of their strategy going forward. But I think just the sheer scale now, inevitably, uh, inevitability of capacity closures will paradoxically actually tighten the, the the market going forward so i i think that capacity probably will adjust sufficiently and in line with the demand underlying demand trend such that actually cracks may not be quite as bad as instinctively one feels that they must be uh sitting here today so fingers crossed it's, yeah fingers crossed you're basically saying for those who manage through this first round of potential rationalizations, there could be a bit more stable margins coming. Yeah, Is that yeah, what so yeah. 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 But then it's a question of also what is your positioning long term, whether you then continue to do yes, that because you're lean and mean, or you then start to say it's time to do something else here because that's what our shareholder really wants. In in the, in the end, um, mm. <clears throat> Europe will still be consuming a significant amount of oil product in 25 years time <clears throat> on on our on current projections um, you know it it takes a big leap of faith uh, to believe that every single vehicle will be 100% electric um any any in in any sort of in the next two planning cycles or possibly even three planning cycles i, I think it maybe that's where we end up but i think that's a long way down the road at the moment and, and if I may, you know, it says to remember, you know, it's going to be a, it's a long way until these, um, you know, the export markets for European gasoline are going to catch up in terms of electrification. Um, so we've still got growing populations in in West Africa, in China and in India, uh, Latin America. I mean, the U.S. You know, I mean, the U.S. Um, is is when I mean, you talk to the average uh, U.S. car driver, and you know, they're still a long way from electric vehicles in the big gasoline consuming states. Um, so it will take some time. And, and the other thing for European um, you know, producers is they you know, have been very adept at getting their gasoline into these export markets. You know, they're very nimble. They're very they can they can compete. Um, you know, they, can, they are you know, it is still the cheapest option for gasoline on the US um, Atlantic coast is gasoline coming out of the ARA. Um, you know, it's still it's cheaper to, to ship it um, from from Rotterdam than it is to pipe it up um, from the from US Gulf. Um, so, you know, the European, um, you know, European suppliers will, will, you know, they will find a way to adapt, I'm sure. And they will stay, they will, they will stay competitive in these, um, you know, the, in these export regions uh, for some time, I'm sure. Um, but like I say, you know, further, further ahead, they, it is only going to be an increased competition, for sure. Um, and we are aware of time here. I mean, Kevin, um, do you, as a final comment here, anything you would add, add on this reflection? Are there, for example, any silver linings or anything else we should we should bear in mind as we look forward here on the markets? Yeah, I, I was somewhat amused by Francis uh, looking for a silver lining by talking about how bleak the landscape is. But I think he's right. I mean, ultimately, you know, refinery rationalizations, the industry rationalization is inevitable. But for, for some of those independents, it's actually going to be a good thing, right? You will get closures of some of the older perhaps more integrated company refineries, so the likes of BP, for example, pulling out, decarbonizing their whole company. That will actually help companies like Saras down in Sardinia to maintain refining margins. So maybe maybe that is that is the silver lining, that for the independents, there is a future, provided the majors basically vacate the space. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, everybody, for this very um, enlightening discussion here. Um, I just want to mention also for anyone listening here is that we will dive into the specific 
topics in separate panels. We have on West Africa coming up here as part of this conference. Um, there's also two sessions on components, uh, one on sort of more traditional uh, blending components and what's going on, for example, relating back to what George said on non-oxy uh, being starting to become a sort of the almost standard blending grade in Europe. Um, but also we have one where we're going to dive into uh, the bio components and how the gasoline can be made even greener um, than it is basically today. So with that, a big thank you, much appreciated, and we will now move over to the Q&A.